Hello everyone, welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Matthew, going verse by verse through the Bible. We come today to Matthew chapter 5, and we resume our study in verse 33. So grab your Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. I want to tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is something that I do on uh, every broadcast, because it's so important that you study the Word of God, and you can study the Bible in its entirety from Genesis through Revelation, one verse at a time, using my audio Bible commentaries. Thirty years of archives are there, so you can go through the entire Bible three times, from Genesis through Revelation. I hope you make use of it. If you love the Word of God, check it out, because that's all that's there. The Word of God in context, from Genesis through Revelation, at thebibleversebyverse.com. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth, in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Jesus says again, Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. In other words, don't go back on a promise. You've been told. You've heard it. Don't go back on a promise. If you if you give an oath, make sure you keep it. And of course, that's a good thing in and of itself. When a, when a person takes an oath... They are asking God to be a witness to the truthfulness of their words. It is saying, God, I want you to hold me accountable for keeping this promise. And God does hold that person accountable. God will punish the person who doesn't keep his oath because God will not be seen as a partner to a lie or a silent witness to a lie. So yes, He will hold you accountable for the oaths that you take. And so it says in verse 34, But I say unto you, Jesus says, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. The religious leaders back in those days had a very complicated system of oaths. And of course, none of it had to do with the Word of God. See, when Jesus came on the scene, he got right back to the pure Word of God. He cut through all the man-made nonsense and the man-made religious teachings. And he got right right back to the Word of God, which is the only important thing. That's what he taught, and that's what he stuck to. But the religious leaders had this racket going, and that's the only thing you could say. And it covered so many different areas of religious life, and this is one of the areas. In their minds, according to their thinking and their man-made rules, some oaths were binding and others were not. And actually, their oaths had become nothing but a complicated, high-sounding excuse for breaking their word. It was a way out of them keeping their promise. For example, and for example, this kind of stuff that they did. You might swear by the altar of God that you would pick up a friend tomorrow at 5 o'clock. Well, 5 o'clock comes and 5 o'clock goes but you don't show up, and they might get upset at you. Well, you said, you promised me that you're going to, you took an oath, you swore by the altar of God that you would come pick me up, and I sat there till 8 o'clock at night, and it was dark, and I froze. I was waiting for you, and you never showed up. Well, the guy would say, well, why did you expect me to show up? I just swore by the altar of God. Now, if I would have sworn by the sacrifice of the altar, well, then, then sure, then I would have been there, but I only swore by the, by the uh, altar of God. That, that's not binding. That's the kind of craziness that they were involved in. And, and their complicated man-made religious rules 
overshadow the simple command of God to tell the truth. See? That's what man-made religious rules do, though. They're complicated, and they overshadow the Word of God. They get so thick sometimes that you can't even get down to the Word. you got to dig and dig, and you still don't get down to the Word of God. And so Jesus says in verse 37, But let your, let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Jesus is saying, will you just please tell the truth? Will you just get rid of all this other kind of garbage and just tell the truth? We don't have to make this thing any more complicated than it really needs to be. Just be a man or a woman of your word. You know? And then you won't have to swear and you won't have to take an oath because people will know that you always tell the truth. Let's do that. Rather than making up complicated systems where you can justify telling a lie, which God does not justify. It doesn't matter. Oaths mean nothing to God when it's that kind of garbage. And then he goes on in verse 38, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And the eye for, the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth principle is very definitely a part of God's law. If you were with us from the beginning in this series through the Bible, you know, we haven't been in, hadn't been that long. We were in the book of Exodus where this law was spelled out by God. It's part of God's law, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It was not, however, intended to promote vigilantism, as some would say, or personal revenge, as some would say. That's not what it's about. Well, this is justice. You knock out my tooth, I'm going to knock out your tooth. No, that's not what it was meant to promote. When God said an eye for an eye, he was simply saying, make sure that the punishment fits the crime, and he was talking to civil government. Don't chop someone's head off because they stole a piece of bubble gum. And don't give someone a little slap on the wrist if they've committed cold-blooded murder either. And so God was telling civil rulers to make sure that the punishment was just, that the punishment fit the crime. Verse 39. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Many times the natural reaction of a sinful human being who has been hurt is to want to hurt back, sometimes without even thinking, right? Just a reflex. But Jesus is saying, don't do that. You don't have to be like them. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to do hurtful things. You don't have to say hurtful things. Just absorb the bad treatment and leave it be. God is the judge of all who do such things. He'll take care of business when the time is right. And that's certainly what Jesus did. He was often insulted, but he never insulted anyone back. Verse 40. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now, Jesus is not, he is not um, promoting stealing. You know, if somebody, if somebody takes your, handkerchief, give him your wallet. He's not, he's not saying that. He's not promoting stealing at any, by, by any means. Look at, look at verse 40 and 41 together. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. In other words, what Jesus is trying to convey is that the things of this world are not worth fighting over. That's the lesson. The things of this world are all going to eventually rot anyway, so what's the big deal? Leave, just leave it be. It's not worth fighting over. If someone's taken advantage of you, pray for them. He's not suggesting that you give them your wallet. He's not suggesting that, that you give them everything for if, they, if they demand of it. He says simply, because that would be promoting stealing, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. So he's, again, the importance of studying the whole Word of God, you see, getting the big picture. But if somebody's taking advantage of you, pray for them. Because they're the loser, not you. In the long run, they're the big loser if they don't repent. 42. Actually, 40, 
42, yes. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not, thou not away. And again, taking this verse within the context of all of Scripture, we will see that God cannot be encouraging laziness by telling us to give people what they themselves refuse to work for. He's not doing that. God isn't encouraging greed by telling us to give things to people, things that they don't even need. Again, that's not it. The lesson here is don't be selfish with your possessions. The lesson here is, again, within the context of the entire Bible, if, there's, if there are people who need help, then help them. Don't be selfish. Verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Now, it has been said, Jesus says, Love thy neighbor, hate thy enemy. And people may say that. People may say, Hate your enemy. But God doesn't. God never says that. He has never said that. God never commands us to hate anyone, not even those who hate us. So whoever was saying that, whoever was teaching that, was uh, you know, teaching an unbiblical thing. 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So it's just the opposite of hating your enemies. Now, I have to hasten to add, God doesn't command us to like our enemies. He nowhere commands us to like anyone. He doesn't command us to want to be around them or to be around them. But God does command us to love them. You say, well, how can I love someone if I don't even like them? Isn't love, like, taken to the next level? No. Love and like don't have anything to do with each other. You say, how can I love someone when I don't even like them? Simple. You love them by being nice to them. And, by, and, and being nice to them includes praying for them. When someone treats you badly, bite the bullet and say a prayer for them. Instead of getting them back, instead of yelling back, bite the bullet and say a prayer for them. The definition of love, according to God, is to do good to someone. Love doesn't have anything in the world to do with feelings or liking everyone, anyone. Liking has nothing to do with loving someone. Verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. God is good to the good, and he is good to the bad. So who are we to think that we cannot be good to those who have been bad to us? According to Jesus, we have no right to be that way. Verse 46. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? See, God wants his people Christians today to have higher standards of conduct for themselves than the average person. Even bad people are generally good to those who are good to them. So what's the big deal if Christians are good to those who are good to them? Congratulations, you're on the same level as a heathen. If Christians are only good to those who are good to them, then they're not acting like God because he's good to those who are, to, who are bad to him. He makes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. He makes the rain to fall on the fields of the farmer who is good and, and not good. Verse 44. Actually, verse 48, sorry. Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. In other words, have God character. And if we're going to be like God, that we have to forgive 
and be kind to everyone because that's what he does. Now, let's go into chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. You know, good works cease to be good when the motives are wrong. Doing good to win the admiration of people is a self-centered motive which isn't right in the eyes of God and then turns that good work into a bad work because the motives were wrong. Self-centeredness, regardless of what form it may take, will never be rewarded by God. Even if, it, if, you, even if it's done in, in apparently what is a, a good work, even, it is the, even if it's the motive for what is apparently a good work, if it's self-centeredness, and sometimes only God knows what the true motive is, he's not going to reward that. He knows what's in your heart. Verse 2, Therefore, when thou dost thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. In other words, when we do something nice, we shouldn't say, hey, everyone, look at me. I want to show you what I'm about to do. I want to tell everybody what I'm about to do. If people honor us because we've done something good, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to run from that. As long as you didn't do the good work for the purpose of being honored. That's when it becomes a selfish motive. That's when it becomes a bad work in the eyes of God. Three. But when thou doest, um, doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. God knows everything that we knew, everything that we do, I should say. God knows everything that we do, and he also knows what we are thinking as we are doing it. So, if we do good because it is good, and because we know it makes God happy, he knows that, and he's pleased with that. In fact, long after we may forget about doing that good deed with the proper motive, God will still remember it. And he will reward us for etern in eternity for doing that. And I think, I think it could be that, that some of us, when we get to heaven and we are rewarded, we're going to be surprised excuse me, by some of these rewards that we get. Because, you know, we're going to forget. That, that was a long time ago I did that good deed. and wasn't that big of a deal. But that was a long time ago. I, I forgot all about that. God didn't. Here's your reward. I don't think much about rewards, eternal rewards in addition to salvation. Maybe I should, but I don't. Verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. God will not answer a prayer that is prayed to draw attention to self. Anyone who tries to be eloquent in prayer in order to impress those who hear is wasting their time. You know why? They're not even talking to God. They're trying to perform in front of some people. If you're worried about what other people think of your prayers, your, your thoughts are not focused on the right person or persons. It should be focused on God and God. What difference is it? Everybody else is eavesdropping. You're talking to God. If they don't like what you're saying or, or how you're stumbling over your words, that's, that's between them and God. You just talk to God and focus on that. Don't worry about what somebody else thinks. Otherwise, you, you find yourself talking to them instead of God. And then your prayers really are a waste of time. Don't try to impress people with your prayers or your prayers aren't going to get answered. You're not even going to be heard. Verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. In other words, don't pray so that other people will admire you. Public prayer is fine. God's not prohibiting public prayer. Public prayer is fine. Public prayer to try to get somebody to notice you is sinful. 
Where we pray isn't the issue. Why we pray is the important thing to God. Verse 7. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Some people, some people repeat memorized prayer, and they don't even think about what they're saying. But words mean nothing to God if they don't come from the heart. On the other hand, the words we use when praying are really secondary. It's true that God says you have not because you ask not. So words in that sense are important. In another sense, words are secondary. If we have a heart for God when we pray, that's the important thing. Because a lot of times we don't even know what to pray for, even how to pray or what we should be asking for. I guess what I'm trying to say is that is that having a heart for God and a sincere attitude that reaches out to God are the most important things in prayer. Not the words that we use. Not who's impressed or who is not impressed. Verse 8. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Prayer does not inform God about anything. Did you know that? Because he already knows everything about everything and everything about everyone, past, present, and future. We don't pray to inform God. I thought I'd just let you in on this, Lord. He knows. We pray because it's how we acknowledge our needs and our dependence on God. We pray because it's how we communicate with God. And that by itself is a valuable thing. We pray because God will answer prayers and do things that he otherwise might not do. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. As I said earlier. Verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye. When, when you pray, pray with the attitude that God is your Father who is in heaven. In other words, when you pray, it's good to remember that he's your father, but he, that he's also the sovereign ruler of this universe and everything in it. Our Father who art in heaven. Just keep in mind who your father is. And those two things will start your prayers off in the right way. Pray that God is your father, your loving father, but pray that, you, pray that God, your father, is your father in heaven the sovereign ruler of all things. That's good. That's good attitude to have when you're first starting your prayer. Just remember those two things. And so he says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, so important. Somewhere in the beginning of our prayers, there should be worship. There should be praying and asking for what God wants, what you know from his word he wants. And of course, the most important thing is for us to be holy. holy. Hallowed be thy name. Lord, let your name be hallowed in my words, in my actions, in my attitudes. And if you're praying for somebody else, Lord, let your words, let your, let your, let your name be honored and, and, and be hallowed in that other person's words and thoughts and actions and attitudes as well. Honor God. Pray that God will be honored. Pray that his name would be hallowed. Honored God because he's worthy of honor. The, the Lord God Almighty doesn't need an ego boost. He's simply worthy of honor and praise. So give it to him. It's the right way. It's the appropriate way to approach our God. And then verse 10. Say this, Jesus says, pray thy kingdom come. Let's just stop there for a second. So after worship in your prayer, after honoring God and praying for the things that you know he wants, because you see it in the word, pray another thing that you know he wants, because it's in the word. After worship, pray for the things, again, that you know God wants. And at the top of that list is for the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven. God's word, God's word is being fulfilled in heaven. 
God's will is being fulfilled in heaven. So pray that his will is fulfilled on earth. Pray the word of God because you know that's what he wants. And that's how his kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, when things are operating according to his word. So pray for his word to be accomplished in your life, every aspect of your being, and in the lives of those that you are praying for as well. And then pray God's kingdom will come in this manner as well. Pray for the salvation of lost souls today, because that's how his kingdom comes into their lives. And that way, his spiritual kingdom on earth, the mystery form of the kingdom of God, will spread here on earth. And then it goes on, Jesus goes on to say, pray thy kingdom come, pray thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In other words, when you pray, be humble. Admit to God that he knows what's best. And therefore, surrender your will to his will when you pray. Doesn't mean you can't pray and ask for, for what you want. But hang on to those prayers loosely because they might not be what God wants. And you got to be all right with that. Always ask God, always God, ask God to do what he knows is best. Pray for what you think is best, but always ask God to do what he knows is best. And be okay with that if it's different from what you prayed. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's faith. That is trusting God. And those things are essential to prayers that glorify God. See, that's, that's what faith is. Faith is not demanding your own way. That's arrogance. That's brashness. You should never be that way in the presence of God. Pray what you think. Pray for what you think is best. And then trust that God will do what he knows is best. And be okay with that. And if it's not what you prayed for exactly, if it's not even close to what you prayed for, be okay with that. That's where faith comes in. You're going to trust him. Even though he didn't give you what you asked for, you're going to trust that he knows what he's doing. And he answered the way he knows is best, not the way you thought was best. That's praying with faith. It's not, it's not demanding what you want and then confessing it over and over and over again, thinking that that is somehow increasing your faith. That's just a bunch of... Witchcraft nonsense is all that is. Last part of verse 10. Thy kingdom come, pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, at this very moment, right now, God is receiving perfect worship in heaven from angels and from glorified saints. It's happening right this second. And also, God's lordship and his kingdom is being acknowledged in heaven right this moment by everyone who's there. His lordship and his kingdom is being acknowledged by every single person, every single angel that's in heaven. And it's important to pray that those things will be true on earth as they are true in heaven. God wants us to pray that his perfect will is being done in every area of our life, just as his perfect will is being done in heaven right now. Again, the thought is, Pray for what God wants, not necessarily what we want. You get, you get the idea here that prayer isn't simply asking for what we want. Prayer is trying to find out what God wants and then praying for it because that honors him. You're asking him for something that you know pleases your heavenly father. And he knows that you're asking it because you know that it pleases him. That blesses him, see, that his child would do that. Just like if your child wants something, maybe, that's contrary to your will, but your child loves you so much that they want to make you happy, so they ask you to do something that they know you want? See? That's the same with us and God. That's our privilege in prayer, to ask for what God wants. And there's nothing wrong with asking for what we want. It's just, again, again, turn it over to God and trust Him if He decides something else is better for us. Um, and I guess that's a good place to stop, and I better stop because I'm just out of, just about out of time. You can continue studying the Word of God, though, if you want, using my audio Bible commentaries at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. Click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter. Open your Bible. 
Follow along as I teach it verse by verse. One more time, that's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if the Word of God blesses you, please also keep in mind that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. You keep this ministry going. If it wasn't for you, I don't know. I guess I'd keep doing it somehow, some way, because God has called me to do it. I'd do it for as long as He wants me to do it. But you can be a part of this ministry, and you can give to support and to be a partner in this ministry. Your prayers and financial support are ways that you can do that. You can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click the Donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead. And keep in mind, I'm counting on you. I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. Never have been. So prayerfully do what God wants you to do. But whatever you do, study the Word of God, okay? And meet me back here next time. We'll continue on in the Gospel of Matthew. Until then, so long, everyone.